It's only entertainment. Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. With me, a couple of authors, Robin Goldstein. He's an economist and director of the Cannabis Economics Group, the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics at the University of California, Davis, as well as Daniel Sumner, uh, a distinguished professor of agricultural resource economics, also at the University of California, Davis. Daniel, Robin, thanks for being with us at The Talking Hedge. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Thank you. You guys are also authors of a book that came out called Can Legal Weed Win? What guys prompted you to write the book? Well, uh, Robert and I have had a lot of interest in economics broadly and and issues related to regulation of food. uh, As Robin likes to say, ingestibles, everything from food and wine uh, around to to cannabis. And um, we were asked half a dozen years ago, five or six years ago, by the uh, Bureau of Cannabis Control, which is what it was named at that time in California, or maybe it was even different. Maybe marijuana was in the name at that time. And they said, could you help us think through the economics of regulations? Because things are changing in California. This was just before the proposition. And um, so we've been doing this for, in terms of an economic study for a long time in a fairly uh, formal, systematic way. And then I would say uh, our goals in writing the book were to kind of distill a lot of what we learned into a, into a really readable kind of conversational format book that was accessible to people who were not trained in economics, but also interested, interesting for people who were trained in economics uh, and talking about the ways that the weed industry is similar and also different from other agricultural industries that we've studied before. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. I've said, I've said just some to hyper- follow up on that, Josh. I, I just, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, okay. our, our focus really is on on the legal industry as an industry. So it's it's not for the general consumer, for example. Though we think some of the stories we tell are interesting to lots of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, for your audience, I think think about where the industry is going, uh, both financially and other ways. Right. Yeah, and I, I've said on the podcast before, if folks that you know don't look at opportunities in the future, like having an entity in Puerto Rico, you trying to utilize Act sixty, or just thinking globally, eventually um, probably won't be around. I've said eighty five percent of CBD hemp companies won't be around if they don't have an entity in Puerto Rico, for example, to utilize Act sixty. And then now there's this New York and California, East Coast, West Coast uh, kind of rivalry again with cannabis. Whereas, you know, you look at California being the fifth largest GDP in the world, and then New York being this new emerging market that everybody loves and and thinks is going to um, rival that of California. I'm curious what you guys learned um, or or maybe what New York can learn from California and what you're able to differentiate or distinguish between those two markets. Well, they're at very different stages. Um, So and going back to 1996, when California first got going, it was the first state to legalize medical or to uh, decriminalize uh, any form of weed um, back in 96. And so there was this uh, medical thriving and well-developed medical weed industry uh, going for 20 years where you had a sophisticated assortment of products, lots of retailers, lots of producers. Um, and it was relatively unregulated by the state. Uh, New York, by contrast, um, had a very, very small um, and very, very highly regulated group of uh, retailers that were basically run like pharmacies and through pharmacies um, where you had to have a special license from the state to do it. And, and so there was a, a not a well-developed medical or any other kind of legal un, uh, regulated or unregulated industry. There was just this very small, uh, over essentially over-regulated uh, segment. And so um, I think New York has a lot, uh, has a big, uh, a long way to go in terms of learning what California uh, had learned previously. Mm-hmm. And I will add to that, if I might, Josh, that uh, a part of our message is what um, uh, what places can learn from California, uh, partly what not to do uh, in the post-proposition uh, era. Mm-hmm. Uh, California has been very enthusiastic, as it is in other places, 
And this, most of this was built into the proposition. Uh, high taxes, high regulations, very tight uh, rules. And this is in the, in the post-medical era. And uh, this isn't uh, choices made by regulators, most of it. Most of it, it was built into the proposition. And in the California context, it's very hard to change anything that's in a proposition. You have to go back to the voters a second time or, or, or something, and it's, it's really complicated. So uh, California, there's, there's a what not to do set of lessons. And, uh, you know, in that sense, I think you're based up in Washington state. And I should say, Robin spent uh, most of his life on the East Coast. He's from Massachusetts originally. And I, I'm not sure where on the planet he is today. But, you, you know, the, I, I, I uh, spent enough time in the East Coast to have a feel for the place, but a, a Californian uh, uh, for almost all my life. So uh, we, we bring both of those perspectives to it. We always like to bring Oklahoma into the conversation, oddly enough, just because it's got lessons for everybody too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of the biggest things you see uh, as a contrast right up front when you compare West Coast to East Coast is just this huge difference in costs um, and in wholesale, wholesale prices and in retail prices. So you see hotel, wholesale and retail prices that are twice as high in, in the East Coast as the West Coast in general. Um, and I'm not going to say that's just because of how long the industry's uh, been around. It's a combination of a bunch of things, regulatory factors, taxes, and uh, efficiency of operations, as well as things like climate that make it uh, cheaper to grow in some places than others. As, as you know, uh, Josh, from your Washington state experience, uh, Washington state's had prices up and down. Uh, and we make uh, clear distinctions between prices of indoor and outdoor and cost of productions, indoor and outdoor, and they can mm-hmm. vary from place to place mm-hmm. for different reasons, different factors are, are driving those. So uh, it, lots of good questions in the air for people in business to try to get straight. That's right. Yeah. Washington state has been a Petri dish experiment, you know, over the last 10 years and, uh, practice doesn't make perfect. I think failure does. And what we could see from the Oregon market, you'll be able to learn in the Oklahoma market down the road with twice as many licenses. So the $19 an ounce in Oregon right now in certain locations, you can expect that with a lot of failures in Oklahoma because of how many, how many licenses they have. So that wholesale price can come down. When you see new emerging markets, you know I, I anticipate Philly to have... Somebody is going to have an investment pitch deck with $7,000 wholesale prices in Philadelphia when that comes on board. Uh, you're going to see six, you know, $500 ounces or whatever. Um, and then these crazy valuations of some of these companies, $420 million arbitrary valuations. So there's a lot of pipe dreams about legal cannabis that's going to be popped uh, when reality hits. Are there any other um, scenarios or examples that you guys have seen in your, in your experience or, or in the book? Uh, well, we, we uh, as you may know, we have a section of the book called Pipe Dreams, <laughs> so, which uh, goes through the kind of valuations and things. And, and I think you said it right, arbitrary, you know, and partly because it's just hard. It's not like the people involved are, are, are big dummies or anything. It's very hard. And it's easy to be optimistic about a future that you don't have a clue what's going to happen. Mm. So you, you tell yourself a scenario, and there are real opportunities uh, in cannabis. Uh, there are also, as you say, opportunities for failure, which is where people may learn most. Uh, I, I'll turn this to Robin quickly, but uh, I will tell you that my, uh, my long-term experience is putting cannabis in the context of other agricultural crops, whether they're indoor grown or outdoor grown. Uh, I did an I did undergraduate thesis decades ago about, about uh, hydroponic greenhouse tomato production. And uh, when I look at things in cannabis, I say, gee, I've, I've seen this movie before. Uh, there's not a walnut gr- grower in California making any money this year. So losing money is not uh, foreign to farmers. Does it need to be a vice? Does it need to be compared to tobacco or can you actually compare it to lettuce? Uh, depends on exactly the question. A lettuce is pretty heavily regulated too, as it turns out. But, but I think you do. So we have spent a lot of time comparing legalization to the removal 
of prohibition on agri uh, alcohol. Robin and I have both written a lot about wine economics. And you think about a crop like wine grapes tied to the wine industry going through prohibition and then removing prohibition. And there are lessons there for us. Not a perfect analogy, but, but there are lessons. I will say I spent a decade of my career doing tobacco economics in North Carolina, which is again, one of the things that uh, I have a paper on cigarette smuggling, for example, uh, an academic sort of a piece of work. So these, there are things to learn from a lot of these uh, different markets. I think one thing that brings together these, uh, what you call vice industries is heavy regulations and high taxes. So that's, that's something that's shared by tobacco, wine, beer, spirits, um, and cannabis um, that where they face similar uh, kind of systems of regulation and pretty much states have around the country have, uh, when drawing up their regulations for cannabis have looked to alcohol as a, as a starting point um, or tobacco and or tobacco. And so they have, they share a lot in common in terms of how they're regulated. Hmm. You, you mentioned uh, cigarette smuggling, Daniel, do you think that they're going to have reverse smuggling where a lot of drugs are being have come into the United States for a long time, but we're seeing in Mexico, they'll buy an ounce of California cannabis for $500 US. So is that the brand and popularity going to be exported then where, you know, we're used to having imp cheap imports? Well, you know, it, it goes both ways. And as you know, uh, for agricultural imports, we partly it's seasonal and partly it's it's a quality and, and characteristics that people want. So, yeah, we we ship uh, farm products from California to Mexico and they ship stuff to us. Same is true with cannabis. Uh, we have cheap enough legal cannabis. Now we may import people from Mexico and other places to be in the cannabis business in the U.S., not on the legal side so much as the illegal side. Um, Canada is a very interesting market. But if we go back to legalization, one of the questions we have is if, if the feds were to simply, I'll, I'll use the phrase decriminalize, Robin means that in a fairly technical way given his legal training, but I'll just use it loosely and say, if the feds were to simply say, all right, we're, we're going to take off the criminal rules we've got. And, and that leads to, say, uh, a relaxation of banking restrictions. And given the U.S. Commerce Clause, some interstate trade and maybe an opportunity for trade with at least with Canada, uh, that will change the market a lot without a whole new layer, what of course, the politicians are talking about, which is a whole new layer of federal taxes, regulations, restrictions, et cetera, that would make a very complicated situation just that much more complicated as, as we see it. You mentioned uh, banking and uh, interstate commerce. A lot of the bills we're seeing right now aren't really addressing interstate commerce. Uh, and so I'm curious what the biggest impact you see um, that, that could could change the way legal weed works right now, obviously with either the Safe Banking Act or federal legalization or interstate commerce or any one of those more important than the other? I, I, was, I would uh, start by saying that I think uh, IRS 280E, mm -hmm. the tax deduction, uh, taking that regulation or, or taking that standard off the books and allowing state-wise legal uh, cannabis businesses to deduct um, expenses normally would probably have a bigger impact than the Safe Banking Act, uh, or, or it would have a bigger impact than the banking, uh, lifting the banking restrictions uh, by itself. Mm -hmm. I think the banking restrictions, of course, will be helpful, but in most states, you're already Ro seeing Robin, sorry cannabis to banks. Sorry to interrupt, Robin. Do you, th do you think uh, retail investors would agree with you? Because you know how these are just move with the news and these pot stocks just move with news and not fundamentals or even technicals. Do you think retail investors would agree with you? I'm sure there'd be a big uh, variety of opinions, but I would say that anyone who's uh, thinking that there's going to be uh, huge waves of impact just from allowing uh, banking uh, would be, I think that that would be an overreaction to that. Because I totally agree with you. I, I don't think banking would be anything, but to be able to write off employee expenses would automatically make a lot of those public companies look a lot more profitable overnight. And, and to be clear, if we Democrat 
just decriminalized, put nothing else in the federal legislation, then cannabis is strawberries. And, and you don't need another law that says, oh, you can trade across state lines. Mm-hmm. We do straight. I mean, if it's just a, if it's just a crop, it's just a crop. And you trade across straight lines and, and nobody tells Wells Fargo they can't uh, lend money to a strawberry grower. So and and same with taxes. There, we don't have special tax provisions uh, for for other commodities. So if you just uh, sort of normalize cannabis without a whole new set of rule or specific rules at all, that would, in a sense, uh, uh, regularize all these other issues. It seems to me. Right, and that would have a much bigger impact than any of the smaller individual banking or or tax related issues just de, just descheduling it as they call it taking it off the schedule of, of federally of federal narcotics mm-hmm. so josh to to your point about about retailers if i can go into my local cannabis dispensary or call my uh delivery person and uh hand them my credit card or give them my credit card that's that's convenient it's not obvious to me how many people say, gee, I think I'll drink wine rather than, than use cannabis today because I can buy my wine with a credit card as opposed to use cash for cannabis. There, occasionally there could be, that could come up. I don't know, it, it, there may be a convenience for somebody to say, gee, I, if I can use my credit card, I don't have any cash so I won't buy illegal cannabis this afternoon. I'll pay twice as much for legal cannabis instead. I don't, I don't know that that's a big demand boost. But around the margins, you know, there's nothing, nobody, no retailer wants hassles for their customers. And, and frankly, cash is a hassle these days. It's just a bother for average run-of-the-mill buyers, consumers. You mentioned, Daniel, that uh, initiatives when passed don't change. Washington State uh, passed a bill or um, a law, rather, making it a Class C felony to maintain and operate a marijuana lounge. I thought that would it was going to be smoothed over in a couple of months, maybe a year. It's been over five years, and, and it's not even a priority uh, with the pandemic. So things don't really move that quick. Um I guess I'm curious about cannabis regulations gone wrong and where you've seen it done better or how improvements could be made. I could, I could give a whole lot of examples about Washington and, and how not to do it. Uh, but from your experience and, and from your book, Can Legal Weed Win? Where have con- cannabis regulations, where are the worst ones at? And then how can it be done better? You're certainly right. Uh, changing regulations is difficult. And when I've observed this fairly closely, especially at state levels, um, uh, politicians like to wait till there's a consensus. You know, they lead by following and, that, and that's natural. So if, if the cannabis industry would speak with one voice and say, gee, this is a screw up, let's fix it then things can get fixed. Uh, But if you say, uh, let's say, take your case of a cannabis uh, lounge or cafe and, and you get half the industry saying, no, no, I don't want that. You know, the people that aren't in the, in the cafe business don't want the competition. You know, what's, why do I, as a legislator, why do I want to wave it, wade into that? And you say, hey, you guys get your act together. You tell us what you want as an industry. Well, that's pretty unrealistic when you've got some people in one half the business, some piece of people in the other, they're going to be on different interests. And you'd like to think that regulators or uh, people like Robin and me who don't have a dog in the fight could say objectively, here's, here's some impacts. Uh, but you know, politically, that's very hard to get things to change. And that's whether it's uh, minimum wages or anything else. Uh, it, it's just tough to get legislators to move unless the industry can speak with one voice. And even then, sometimes it's hard. What I'm seeing uh, before you chime in, Robin, I'm, what I just want to say what I'm seeing is the legislative process giving limited licensed states like Nevada an edge is it has to be lobbyists giving them that because if it were something like in Washington where you had you know the hippies on the corner getting everyone to to sign these 
um, to, to sign initiative 502 or you know, proposition 215. Those were for the people I feel like, and even then you can't change it. But some of these limited license states are designed by MSOs for MSOs. That's how I feel. Robin, what's your opinion? Yeah, I mean, the, of course, the more you limit licenses, the more there's a, a window for uh, for political influence and cronyism to, to play a big role in who gets licenses and, and how the industry uh, sp- spreads out. Um, I... I don't, I'm not sure if, if Dan, if you have much more to say about the limited license uh, issue in particular. Yeah, let me just say in California, at least, that has been mostly a local issue. Yeah, that's right. And you really see that locally. So you'll see uh, a, a town with, uh, you know, let me say this uh, more cannabis dispensaries in some towns of a hundred thousand people than there are in, in San Diego with a million or, or things like that. And then who gets that license, you know, uh, with, with no corrupt, no explicit corruption, not, not anybody actually sliding money under the table to somebody, you still get, ah, well, somebody's got a brother-in-law or somebody knows somebody who knows somebody and all of those things uh, uh, or, or somebody promises to be socially responsible in ways that seem appealing to uh, a city council member. But all of that, frankly, raises costs to consumers. And so the average consumer loses on those things every time, everywhere, uh, in every industry, everywhere in the world that I've looked at. And I've studied everything from egg quotas in Canada on around to Australian trade, uh, Australian tradic, uh, uh restrictions in cannabis and lots of other commodities. Mm-hmm. And it's always the same thing. The consumer pays. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and of course, that, businesses that can't get in pay. That's yeah. the other group that pays. Yeah, actually, that's what I was going to add there is that the MSOs uh, setting up systems that benefit them is at the expense of the legacy, uh, whether it's medical or, or illegal uh, operations. The, pe- the people were trying to help by legalizing and by taking them getting them off the criminal books uh it obviously makes it a lot more difficult for for those folks to uh to get into the legal industry there's a lot of other things facing them no matter what um beyond just policy they don't know how to they're not experienced or skilled at doing any kind of legal business getting local permits to do anything uh whether or not the licenses are limited there's a lot of uphill battle battles there uh, I, Josh, I wanted to come back for a second, if you don't mind, to the lounges, because I, as I understand it, you were in that business. Is that right? That's how I got into the cannabis industry was I was going to start the Seattle Super Chronic Cafe. Yeah. And then uh, what happened to that uh, effort? So I launched uh, April of 2015. And then in, so I'm looking for a spot, you know, for the cafe I'm looking for investors. I'm looking for chefs, all of that. And then bam, Washington in June uh, hits us with a class C felony. Anyone who has one or is going to be doing it is going to be hit with a class C felony. And so I pivoted to catering and event planning. And that was never my intention. I was just waiting for the law to, to get overturned. And so after about six months, I was like, this is not what I want to do. Uh, and then that just kind of pivoted into um, consulting. Okay. Yeah. In California, we've, they do essentially create an opening for people to do lounges. But one of the interesting things we noticed that we mentioned in the book as well is that, um, that they ban alcohol or tobacco on the same premises. So, uh, and, and we cite that as a possible reason it could be harder uh, for canvas lounges to get off the ground. You know, some, a group of people go into a place, some of them want to drink and some of them want to right. consume weed. And so, you know, that group can't go in there together and, 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 uh, and do what they want. That's unfortunate with Vegas is they assume people that are going to go to a bar are going to drink and consume alcohol. Whereas with me and my wife are in Amsterdam, she drinks wine or she drank wine and I drink, I smoke cannabis. Um, so you're going to have you know, different people. I think um, the tribal communities have a great opportunity for blunts and traditional uh, tobacco. Uh, but that, that's not I mean, in California. They love their blunts. And I do, too. Guilty pleasure, whatever. Uh, but we don't have spliffs in the U.S. Nobody really um, adds tobacco into a cannabis joint. You know, usually speaking, it's the wrap. So you'd have to go to a tribal for that. 
but that's not that's not really the issue. I think the issue is they look at it as a blight to the community, not in my backyard, the NIMBY group. Uh, and they think of it as kind of a strip club. They don't want windows on there. It's just, it's kind of these ridiculous laws uh, to, but I think it's the soul of the community. As soon as you see it and how, um, how much better it is than alcohol, um, it's, it's just a, a better, um, uh, it's a better experience. I, I think once we have those, it'll be a lot better. Um, but before we wrap this up, I want to ask one last question about the future of cannabis and what we can expect. Um, can legal weed win if there's global legalization, the cost of production in cannabis is six bucks in the U S the dollar 30 and in Latin America, it's like 15 cents. So is that the ultimate demise of legal weed in the U S well, not as consumption. And, and I'm not, um, uh, one can, if let's think about cannabis in the context of, of wine, for example, you have a whole range. I don't know that we'll have, uh, uh, a, uh, a ton of Cabernet Sauvignon grapes from Napa is $10,000. What you and I might look at, and they look like the same grapes are $500 if they come from a few miles away. So uh, partly there's a quality difference and there's a quality of processing and all of those things. But frankly, if cannabis becomes a commodity in the U.S., uh, I'm fairly confident that U.S. producers can be a reasonably competitive. Now, where it's, uh, as we know, very challenging is anything that is highly labor intensive for a relatively low cost labor. That's a problem. And what you tend to do in high wage places is go to more mechanization or more uh, computer controls or something. And we're doing that already in the greenhouse business, for example, for production. But trimming may be, and, and I don't think anybody studied it really systematically yet. Trimming may be the, the barrier. It may be the case that there's so much trimming that the U.S. would specialize in, in say, manufactured products and, and trimmed cannabis uh, flour would come from Mexico or someplace with either, even lower labor. We could also grow it in Washington state indoors where electricity is cheap and, and ship it. It's a high value product. So shipping costs are about trivial when it's legal. Ship it quickly down to uh, Oaxaca where they trim it and ship it right back to uh, the market in, in Chicago. So there are lots of scenarios that we can picture if this was treated like a, like a normal, normal crop. Yeah. With investment in technology. I mean, we're good at technology, so that's, that's one place we could really compete. And, but uh, investment in big machinery and stuff like that. Uh, I think that that will increase as, as the taboo is lifted and as more States legalize, if it's federally uh, decriminalized or even yeah, regulated and, it, and taxed. Yep. And the only thing I would say, Robin, there is it doesn't have to be big machinery. You know, it, yeah. it, you know, there, there's scales. Uh, a scale works on retailing. There are small retailers competing with big retailers, same in farming, same in other businesses. Yeah. But I wouldn't rule out the fact that recognizing that this is a really high value per unit of weight product in any scenario compared to almost anything, which means transport is cheap relative to to the product itself. So the idea you grow at one place, you process it somewhere else and you consume it at a third place is a natural way to think about cannabis, it seems to me. And we ought to keep that in our, in our uh, as we think about potential scenarios, five, 10, 20 years down the road, I would keep that in, people should keep that in their mind. I always mention that hops are grown here in the Yakima Valley in Washington and then distributed everywhere. Like these, uh, there's a lot of micro breweries that don't grow their own hops. They just get it from oh, somewhere yeah. else and then they make their own and no one chastises them for not growing it from seed to table. Whereas in cannabis, for some reason right now, that's the expectation um, is that you have full control all the way, even in all the way to retail. So once that starts to get segmented up, we'll see a massive amount of consolidation, capitulation for those that don't want to give up but have to. Those that think there'll be a legacy end up finding out that they're just not able to survive. And all of that pain will, will 
find its way with the altruism in the industry and those that aren't even paying themselves a salary, all of that will kind of wash away with big cannabis kind of coming in right now, automating with large machines, uh, eventually kind of setting that standard. So the craft cannabis can grow from the ashes of what, what big cannabis is about to lay down. And we have, um, uh, relatively small strawberry farms competing with big strawberry farms. So I, I see potential for competition in all kinds of yeah. ways, uh, as long as people stick with what they're good at. Mm-hmm. It was just news today in California how, pe- how, how some companies are uh, removing vertical integration. Mm-hmm. And you ha- have people that are really good at growing saying, you know what, uh, I, I never really wanted to be a retailer anyway. Mm-hmm. And somebody else says, uh, no, no, my sister-in-law is really good with people. We really like running our retail operation. And fortunately, co- cousin Josh is the guy who likes to farm. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, vertical integration can work, but there's nothing obvious about it. When you have, you have skills as the grower, that doesn't make you a good manufacturer of manufactured products, for example. Yeah, oh, yeah one, um, one thing about competing in the craft market, which uh, that I think is really important is that uh, as with wine, I think you're going to see competition on a region. So if a region becomes known, if Yakima Valley or uh, Humboldt County or Western Massachusetts becomes known as a premium cannabis origin, then the producers in that whole region will rise up together and be able to command premium prices that can compete on the higher end. Uh, and I think it's a question of uh, what regions will become known. Obviously, there's some regions in the West Coast in California and Northwest that already have this name for cannabis like Amsterdam does. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think one interesting thing about uh, competing on regional origin is that that's really more related to climate. So when you have indoor grown, you can kind of do that anywhere. um, And uh, as with beer, but outdoor grown cannabis is more like wine, which is outdoor grown, where people care about where it comes from. So Mm -hmm. I think that although you have historically this lower priced and lower potency weed coming from outdoor farms, uh, partially just because they're hiding themselves from satellite uh, cameras and they they have to cover their canopy and a bunch of they're not trying to uh, focus on maximum potency but mm-hmm. i think that if outdoor farms are able to establish themselves as being of the highest and most interesting quality for connoisseurs actually comparing uh, different climates and different types of soil things like that they'll have a better uh, they might have a better chance that, than indoor uh, farms with uh, in competing in the premium market nationally or internationally I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guests, Daniel Sumner and Robin Goldstein, authors of Can Legal Weed Win? You guys, where can they find you at? Where's the book at? Let everybody know. They can order it on Amazon right now. It won't be delivered for a little while. They're in the process of printing. That's been delayed for the same reason everything else got delayed with the the logistics. Mm -hmm. But Amazon's probably the best place to order it right now but they can also order it from the university of california press all right sounds good you guys are on on linkedin as well we're both on linkedin um and uh i'm on twitter robin s goldstein and instagram hipster patrol okay <laughs> all right uh, check out the book can legal weed win so i think with that we're out of here i'm josh kincaid Thanks. this is the talking hedge don't forget to like share and subscribe or don't and i'm out With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.